brothers and sisters. We're reading uh, Mark 8, 34 through 38. Swipe or turn your page there. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed, when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Uh, glad to have you all here this morning. Glad you've chosen to come and worship with us this Advent season as we, we're in a three-week series on discipleship that we'll come back to again after Christmas, but uh, also celebrating our Savior's birth together through song these weeks, and glad you've come to be with us. Uh, three, four-year-olds through fifth graders should already be across the hallway, but if you didn't get that message and you want to go now, you're welcome to go and join the Kids for Children's Church across the way. We're sending them there at the beginning of the service just for a few weeks now so that they can prepare for the Christmas program. But uh, otherwise, the kids are welcome to go now off to Children's Church across the way. Thanks. Bless you. If you would take those uh, booklets or pads as they're inside, your, uh, inside of your rows or aisles and sign those and pass those down, we appreciate that, everyone letting us know each week that you're here. And if you're a visitor with us, there's a card in the front of that. If you would fill that out and uh, uh, turn it into the Welcome Center, we've got a gift for you that we'd love to give to you. And then if you turn that in, we'll send you a letter with some more information about the church so you can learn a little more about us. Welcome. We're glad you're here today. Apologize for my <clears throat> throat. We're going to do the best we can. Uh, so sorry that the impact on your ears is it's... <laughs> little scratchy this morning. So glad you're here. We're looking at Mark chapter 8. Let's pray and then we'll come to the text together. Father, pray that you would be gracious to your servant here and to the hearers, that it would not be distracting uh, the <clears throat> quality or condition of my voice, but that they would hear you speak, that you would come by your spirit today and do that which you've promised, to come among your people and move and might and power when your people are gathered together in your presence. And they say, speak, Lord, your servants hear. We come ready, we come open, we come willing, we come receptive, we come hungry. And we pray that you would feed our souls. We pray that you would show us the way. We pray that you would... Um, Make our resolve greater as we want to serve you, love you, give ourselves to you, be devoted to you, be committed to you. Would there be uh, a renewed determination in our relationship with you today because of the way your spirit speaks through the word? And we leave here today sold out for Christ, wholehearted, devoted followers of Jesus because that is life to us today. And that is life to us forever. So come and move among us now. We pray to your glory. Amen. Amen. Well, many of you know the story of Corey Ten Boom, as is told in the book The Hiding Place, and by the movie of that name. And if you've never seen that movie, I recommend it to you, or read the book. And it's the story of the Ten Booms who were uh, Christians living in Germany during World War II, and they, I think it was Germany, are they German? Holland, Holland, yes, uh, not Germany. And they uh, were rescuing Jews, they were hiding them in the home above their father's clock-making shop, and uh, eventually they were discovered and arrested and led to concentration camps where many of the family died. Corey lived and told the story, and it was recorded and written down and has been an encouragement and challenge to many. But in the book, at one point, she describes there's a pastor at their home, and they've got this 
mother and child, this Jewish mother and child, that they're looking for a place for them to hide. And she takes the baby, she puts this baby before this pastor and says, would you be willing to take a Jewish mother and her baby into your home? They will almost certainly be arrested otherwise. And the color drained from his face, she says. Miss Tenboom, he said, I do hope you are not involved with any of this illegal concealment and undercover business. It's just not safe. Think of your father and your sister. And on impulse, she told the pastor to wait and ran upstairs. And with the mother's permission, she took the little infant into her arms and back into the dining room. She pulled back the coverlet from the baby's face. There was a long silence. The man bent forward, reaching for the tiny fist. Compassion and fear seemed to struggle visually in his face. And then he straightened and said, no, definitely not. We could lose our lives for that child. Well, then Corey's father was around the corner. And uh, he says, give the child to me, Corey. And looking to the little face, he said to the pastor, you say we could lose our lives for this child. I would consider that the greatest honor that could come to me and to my family. And on that, the pastor turned on his heels and walked out the room. Now, suppose you're the one that she has this baby in her hands, and she says, would you, at, the, at great risk to yourself and to your family and to your life, would you take this baby and her mother into your home? What would you do? Would you be willing to pay the cost of your discipleship? That's the question that Mark's going to ask us through Jesus' words here in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and following. Last week we talked about following Jesus, becoming his disciple, and today we're going to talk about the cost of this discipleship as Jesus sets us before it, sets it before us here in these verses. Now you remember there are always two contexts in the Gospels. There's the context in which Jesus spoke the words, and then there's the context in which the author wrote the words and the book was distributed. So you understand there's kind of these two worlds, and then there's our world, really, Three worlds you have to keep in mind whenever you're reading your Bible. Well, Mark's context in which he's recording the words of Jesus is just at the time when Nero, the Roman Empire, has just lit the Roman way with the burning corpses of the bodies of Christians that he blamed for the fire in Rome. Uh, the intensity of the opposition to the Christian movement as it's spreading through the Roman Empire has been ratcheted up to the point that Christians are now losing their life for their faith. And Mark is writing to those Roman Christians, that's the context that these words about being willing to pay the cost of your discipleship come when Christians are being burnt alive for their faith. And in this context... Mark quotes Jesus, verse 34, saying, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So last week was a call to follow Jesus as his disciple. Now Jesus is telling us what that looks like, very simply. To follow Jesus is to die to self, to deny ourselves. In contrast to many people's perception or the way they live their Christian life, which is to, is to have this distinction between the sacred and the secular. They come to church, they worship, they sing some songs, very nice, maybe give a little gift, and then go out and live like the rest of the world the rest of the week. And they have this separation of these two worlds in which they live, both and. I can have Jesus and I can have my life in the world. No, Jesus says. Uh, Kierkegaard says it's either or you are a disciple of Jesus or you're not. There's no distinction of this sacred and secular. If you say to Jesus, I will follow you, you are all in. There's no dividing your life into those parts that are for Jesus and those parts that are not for Jesus. You can't be like some politicians say, well, you know, my personal belief is this, but 
in my public life or in my, my legislative life, I don't want to impose my beliefs on others. That's rubbish and nonsense. <laughs> uh, you can't, uh, everybody operates out of a certain worldview by which they cast their vote <laughs> or they act in their everyday life. If you have a businessman who says, yes, I'm a Christian, but it's business, not personal. Well, that's stupid. <laughs> that's just, you can, there, there's no way you can say, I'm a follower of Jesus and not have that infiltrate every aspect of your business life because there's no distinction because it's all one it's all under the umbrella of the lordship of christ to whom you gave your life he's the king and he reigns over every thought every deed every moment every day when you say i will follow him because to follow him is to deny yourself see your finances your schedule, your calendar, your internet viewing habits, your business, your relationships, your friendships, everything comes under the Lordship of Christ. And it's his way, not our way, for the rest of life in every realm of life. That's what it means to follow him. He defines it further. Let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, you know, crosses in our day, I mean, Madonna gets up on the stage and she's wearing a big cross, you know, and it's, it's something that is approved of and the cross is, is jewelry and the cross is on buildings everywhere and on the Christmas crosses or lit crosses. When Mark says to the Romans, cross, well, that's just what they were lit on and burning in Rome. The cross is an emblem of shame. The cross is an emblem of disgrace. The cross is an emblem of rejection by the world. The cross is an emblem of suffering and pain and death and rejection. And in that context, he quotes Jesus saying, take up your cross and follow him. Here's how uh, James Edwards puts it in his commentary on Mark. Modern culture is exposed to the symbol of the cross primarily in jewelry or figures of speech like bearing a cross, putting up with an inconvenience or hardship. How vastly different was the symbol of the cross in the first century? It was an image of extreme repugnance. It was an instrument of cruelty, pain, dehumanization, shame. The cross symbolized hated Roman oppression and was reserved for the lowest social classes. It was the most visible and omnipresent aspect of Rome's terror apparatus designed especially to punish criminals and quash slave rebellions. And in that context, Jesus says, here's what it means to follow me. You take up your cross. As Bonhoeffer says, the cross is not a, an end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life. But the cross meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When God calls a person, he bids them come and die. I read the story this week of the Franklin Expedition. Actually, it's an 11-page article that was in McLean's Magazine a number of years ago. My wife read it, read it yesterday, all 11 pages. It's quite a story, and it's, it's quite shocking and appalling. Franklin was sent off by the, the Brits in uh, 1845 trying to find the Northwest Passage, how to get from the Atlantic o Ocean to the Pacific Ocean across Canada. And this had been a great goal of the British Empire. Many had failed, and so they sent out 130 of their best soldiers, their best men under Franklin's leadership, this man who'd fought with Nelson and was this great respected British leader, and off they went to try and find the Northwest Passage in these two ships. And they went in their fine British uniforms. All of the officers had servants that were set, sent with them to make sure they kept their buttons on their uniforms nicely polished. <laughs> they came with swords as part of their uniforms. There were mahogany writing desks for all of the officers. 
There was fine silverware and teacups so that they could have their British tea at the appropriate time and, and uh, act like proper British gentlemen. Uh, they had uh, this goal to get across, but uh, the ships got stuck in the, the ice and they had to abandon the ships eventually. So they had these 1,200 pound boats pulled in these sleds and, went, and they but you had to keep these boats repaired. They had these lead sheets that they had in there. They had all the hammers and tools in there. They had the mahogany writing desk in the sled as they're trying to pull it across the ice. Just the, the man. It was the man. There were the officers. The officers didn't pull. <laughs> they walked behind in the snow packed down by the sled after the man pulled the sled on ahead of them. And then the officer's servant came behind with the, with co complete with the, the kit to keep his buttons polished as they <laughs> walked across the ice now, starving and hungry and dying, and they're pulling sleds that weighed 1,800 to 2,400 pounds, and they're trying to pull them across the ice with loaded down, and slowly, and we know this because there was this little, this trail that you could follow as they jettisoned more and more of the junk that they were pulling as they made their way across Canada, and I got on the internet yesterday and looked at the two islands where the, all this debris was left as they made their way across, and then, and then bones were left as some of them died, and eventually all 130 of the expedition died because they tried to take it with them. I mean, it seems so ridiculous, so uh, the, the folly of pulling these sleds with hundreds and thousands of pounds of worthless things with them as they made their way across the ice. But, you know, we do that, don't we? We try to have, have it both ways, our feet in both worlds. We say yes to Jesus, but there's all this stuff for the world we want to take with us. We want to carry with us as we follow Jesus when he said you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross if you're going to follow me. That's all left behind if you're going to follow me. If anyone would come after Christ, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. Well, why would anybody do that? Why would you be willing to pay this cost? Well, Jesus gives us four reasons here, four motivations, and this is a Look for the conjunct when you're reading your Bible, look for the conjunctions because there they are. It's literally the word for four times. For, 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 I mean that F O R. Four times F O U R. The word for, F O R, appears in your text, giving you these four motivations, these four encouragements for following Jesus. First, to lose your life is to save your soul. Verse 35, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. Why would you pay this price? Well, life here is used in a couple different ways. It's used in reference to our physical life, which we will all lose, and our eternal life that is used here equivalent with the word soul, which is the eternal part of us. So we can lose our life, that is the physical side, which we're all going to lose anyway, in order to gain our life or gain our soul, which is the eternal part of us, which ought to be the first priority. Those who want to save their life in the eternal sense uh, will we'll surrender to Christ and put aside everything else. Those who do not want to lose their life, that is this world's life, that is riches, that is wealth, that is approval, that is applause, that is titles, that is my control over things in my life. Those who want to keep this in this life will lose forever in the life to come. That's what he's setting before us here, these two contrasts. Those who keep their life as their own, not willing to submit to Christ as their king, not willing to pay the price of discipleship, they ultimately lose everything. Not eternally saved from death and destruction, but eternally lose everything because here they kept everything. 
contrast to those. It's the argument from the lesser to the greater. Everybody here, unless the Lord comes in our lifetime, everybody here will die. It's a pretty uh, consistent statistic. <laughs> one out of one. Not 0.999, not 0.999. One out of one. Okay, well, there was Enoch. Okay, so somewhere way down there, uh, 0.999. Okay, there's, it's just almost, it's almost exactly one to one. Uh, unless you're Enoch, I guess there's an exception. He was walking with God, and then God just took him. Wasn't that great? Uh, there was one notable exception in Scripture. You're going to die, right? I'm going to die. You're going to die. I'm closer than some of you. A couple of you are closer than me. and uh, Maybe. We don't know that, do we? Uh, yeah, we don't know when we will die, but we will die. So it doesn't matter what bank accounts you have. It doesn't matter what doctors you have. It doesn't matter what alarm systems you have, what careers you have, what titles you have, what recognition you have. You're going to leave it all behind eventually anyway. So he's saying, come to Christ. Give yourself to him. He will be all your hope and security and life in this world and your certainty of life to come. Because Jesus died and rose again. He has power over death. And you're in relationship with him. If you follow him, you will follow on the path with him. Yes, in suffering in this life, which is the only path to glory in the next life. You can't say, I want to follow Jesus into glory without following Jesus on the path of discipleship. You can't separate those two. You can't have it both ways. You follow on the path of Jesus here if you're going to follow on the path of Jesus there. So Corey Ten Boom takes this baby, and she's holding out in front of you. Why? Why do you take this? Why, would, why did her... Most of them died in concentration camps because they did this. They died. Why would you do that? Were they stupid? Were they foolish? Was it a poor exchange? Absolutely not. No. Jim Elliott says he's no fool who gives what he cannot keep, your life in this world, to gain what he cannot lose, life in the next world. It is a small thing to give your life in this world that you may gain everything in the realm of to come. That's the first reason to give your life to Jesus. Second, the world is not enough. Really, 36 and 37 go together, so we're going to look at these two from one side and then the other. The world is not enough. Two, two ways of saying the same thing. So here, let me emphasize the worthlessness of the world. There is nothing I mean nothing, I mean absolutely nothing in this world that is your ultimate happiness. There is nothing in this world that if you grab it and lay hold of it, you say, yes, now I have life as it was meant to be lived. There's nothing you can claim in this world that is truly your life. We see this all the time in the people who have everything that our world considers life, and yet they don't have life. Politicians and actors and actresses and musicians who have everything. That, just take musicians, for example, from Brad Delp to Kurt Cobain to Amy Winehouse to Michael Jackson to Prince to Tom Petty to uh, you, you name them. They died of indulgences because they had everything and they were not happy. It wasn't enough. The world is not enough. How much of the world do you think you need to have before you've got peace, security, and happiness? Well, you'd have to have, if you had it all, it's not enough. It's not enough in the world to fill or provide that which only Jesus can provide. Solomon told us this years ago in Ecclesiastes, centuries ago. It's still true. It's just, it's, it's dust. There's a story told about how Africans catch monkeys. And uh, as the story is told, I've never seen this personally, but uh, they, they take a coconut and they 
cut a hole in the coconut just big enough for a monkey to get his hand in the coconut. They hollow the coconut out and they fill it with rice. And then the monkey comes and he sticks his hand down in that hole and he grabs hold of a fistful of rice. Well, now he can't get his fist out of the hole. And the monkey will bang that coconut and he's trying to do everything to get get some of that rice, but he will not let go of that rice. And even when they approach him with nets and they're going to capture him, he's not going anywhere because he's got rice in his hands and he's not going to let go and is very easily caught. Won't let go. The question is, what is it that you won't let go of? I mean, is there anything in this world that you think is life to you that you are clutching, you're, you're holding, you won't let go of it because you think it is your life. Jesus says, let it go. Let it go. It's, it is not life to you. Come to the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. But to come to him, you've got to let it go. The world is not enough. Third, the soul is of eternal value. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What can a man give in return for his own soul? There's this this eternal part of you that is the... what Anything in this world is nothing compared to this eternal issue and the eternal value of the soul and this eternal part of you. So what if you give up the approval of your peers? What if you give up... Uh, financial security? What if you give up your health? What if you give up your friends? What if you give up your family? What if it costs you your life? What have you given up in contrast to your own soul? It's the soul that you've gained and it's the soul that is eternal. I've mentioned this passage before, but it's so stark to me, especially after I love reading the stories of the uh, Scottish covenanters, these faithful men and women who in a time of persecution went to death for their faith. And you know, sometimes they would, as a warning to others, they would um, bring them to the guillotine, they would lop off their head, and then they'd take their head and they'd stick it on the pikes, on the, these, these fence poles in the public square as a warning to the rest. Don't you follow Jesus to your death like they did. So here's Luke 21. Before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my sake. You will be delivered up even by parents and brothers and relatives and friends. And some of you, they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not one of your, one hair on your head will perish. What? No. They will put you to the guillotine Lop off your head, stick it on a pike, but not one hair on your head will be touched. Does that make sense to you? (laughs) Well, it's it's a divine logic. Because you can lose your head, but they can't touch anything that's eternal. They can't take anything from you that really matters. They can't touch anything. They can't touch your soul which is the eternal you, that is the very thing that is saved by your willingness to pay this price. We follow Jesus because the soul is of eternal value. The next verse in that passage is, by your endurance, by your perseverance, you will gain your life. Fourthly, The final verdict is the one that counts. Verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angel. Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words. I like, I I love the way he puts it here because there are people who say they follow Jesus, but it's the Jesus of their own making. It's the Jesus of their own design. It's the Jesus that they've chosen to follow, that they've fashioned, not the Jesus who has spoken. 
If you say, I follow Jesus, you follow Jesus as he revealed himself in his words. It means embracing the Jesus who is revealed in this book. It's embracing the Jesus who says these hard sayings. It's embracing Jesus as he has disclosed himself, not as you have said, this is the Jesus I want to follow, and you design your own. It's a, it's a designer Jesus. <laughs> And you self-design them and follow the Jesus that you want to follow. No, Jesus and his words. You follow him as he calls you to follow. On the path he calls you to walk. Jesus is referring to those here who are like chameleons, who they conform to the will and way of the world, but they say they follow him. He's talking about those who, you know, put their finger to the wind. He's talking about those who follow every uh, opinion poll and are unwilling to pay the cost of their convictions. They, they follow him with their lips, but their hearts are far from him. They, they cower to others and they conform to their peers and they go along with the crowd because they're ashamed of him and not willing to pay the price. And Jesus says of you, on the last day he'll say, depart from me. Never knew you. Never knew contrast to what Paul says he hopes to hear at the end of his life. <laughs> uh, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. So what will Jesus say to each of us on the last day? Never knew you. Or <laughs> welcome my friend, my servant. Enter into the joy of your master whom you've served all your life. There are only two destinies. There are only two ways. And there are only two days, as Luther says. There's today and there's the last day. The question is, are we denying ourselves, taking up our cross, and following Jesus today? Well, then we have gained our soul on the last day. Have you seen the movie Up? Kids, have you seen the movie Up? Isn't that a fun movie? It's one of my favorite, uh, I think it's my second favorite Disney movie. Uh, the, the one with the, with the emotions, what's that one? What do you call that? Inside Out. Yeah, that's my favorite. I can't, even, I can't remember the name of my favorite. But okay, it's, uh, Inside Out is my favorite. This, Up is my second favorite. And up, you know, the story, I mean, this, this, these big, greedy developers want to take over this whole area in the big city so they can have it all for themselves and make all kinds of money. And there's this one guy, everything else is gone. It's a scorched earth all around him. And there's one, one house that's left. You know what they call those houses? Anybody know? Nail houses. <laughs> There's actually a term for these houses. They're called nail houses because these big greedy developers have pounded down everything else around them. And it's like there's one nail sticking up that doesn't matter how hard they pound, that nail just will not go down. I like that picture. I identify with that old guy. I mean, not the floating off with the balloons and the whole thing, but that's pretty cool. And it was a fun movie. The, the nail house, it's... It, I'm going to stand here, though everybody else caves in. Everybody else gives in. Everybody else walks away. Everybody else is pounded down. I will stand. And that's the kind of person that Jesus is describing here, right? The world can pound on you, but you're not going anywhere. Doesn't matter how hard they pound, you're going to stand. Because you stand for something that goes beyond this world you stand for something that is eternal, and so you stand. It doesn't matter how the world receives you. It doesn't matter what the world says about you. It doesn't matter how the world treats you. It doesn't matter what the world takes from you. Because those who lose their life in this world gain their life forever in the next the Christian life is not so much, I don't, know what, I don't know how the gospel was first presented to you. Come to Jesus, and it'll be like sitting in a hammock, slipping, sipping tea by an ocean front in the Caribbean. <laughs> is that how the gospel, I don't know. 
Uh, I don't think we do very well at presenting the cost of discipleship sometimes in our evangelism presentation. Because what we ought to say is, come to Jesus and it will be like storming the beaches of Normandy in World War II. It's not the beach where you're sipping the, ha- the tea in the hammock. <laughs> it's, it's, it's storming the gates of hell. That's what, that's what you're called to do. It will not be easy. It will not be comfortable. But what will you give in return for your, your own soul? Whoever saves his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. It is true, Romans eight thirty six. it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. Wasn't that our Jesus? He was a, like a sheep led away to slaughter. If that was his path, that will be our path. We walk on the path of discipleship following him. But in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am, I like, I like, must be what translation? New American Standard. I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Yes, we will be like sheep to be slaughtered, but we will be more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord, and we will reign victorious with him forever. So with that in mind, let's profess our decision to follow Jesus as the worship team comes.